Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tara Bruce, and we are coming to you live from the Core at Law and Cantata. If you are logging in right now, it is May 4th at 12 p.m., and we are getting ready to kick off our second lecture in a long haul COVID lecture series in partnership with Pima County. Today's lecture, we are going to dive in a little bit more on a topic that we touched on in our panel last month, talking about uh, the long COVID functional neurological deficits that some people are experiencing after COVID-19. Our presenter today is Dr. Mo Mortazavi. You may have recognized him from our panel last month, and he's here today to really do a breakdown of some of those questions that you guys had about this brain fog or things not feeling the same since you've had COVID. So a few key things to know. We've got a live in-studio audience here at the core with us today that will be asking questions, but as live stream viewers, you too can ask those questions, and we have have a team ready to get those relayed to Dr. Mo and hopefully get some answers for you. So if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, just type those questions in. We'll do our best to get as many of those answered in the hour that we have. This event, for those of you that are watching live, will also be available on our YouTube channel about 24 hours after we conclude today's lecture. So if you miss it or you can't stay for the whole event, do know the lecture in its entirety will be on our YouTube channel. Just type in Tucson Medical Center. If there's any questions for Dr. Mo, again, type those in, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Dr. Mo, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Tara. Um, I'm Mo Mortazavi. Thank you all for being here today, um, both in person and everyone that's uh, on Zoom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I've done this talk a number of times, so probably move through the slides relatively quickly just to get through them all and have some time for all the questions. Um, I'll just start with, you know, our services at Spark and sort of how we cross paths with long COVID. So actually we're not a COVID center. Um, we're a comprehensive concussion center. So we're a brain injury center along with our sports medicine, rehab, and some of the other things we do at our center. Um, but what we noticed as we followed the research on long COVID is that the predominant symptoms and deficits after long COVID are neurologic, functional fatigue symptoms, et cetera. And they looked very similar to what we see in our brain injuries. It's just that in one case, the insult's traumatic. In another case, the insult's in, uh, an infectious insult. So um, we've been seeing a number of patients, uh, uh, you know, relatively small panel of patients through the clinic. And not only am I going to review some of the research on long COVID, but we'll go over, you know, our panel, some of the um, data and research that we've submitted based on the folks that we've seen um, at, at our clinic at Spark. This is our comprehensive concussion team. And so we've got a multidisciplinary team that works with brain injury that includes MDs, NPs, PAs, neurooptometrists, uh, uh, therapists, athletic trainers. So we do approach brain injury very comprehensively and, and, and in a multidisciplinary way. And it's really been the same for long COVID. So um, we have a pediatric sports medicine team and also sound uh, guided intervention team for musculoskeletal injuries. A little bit about me, my background. Um, I, I went to school predominantly at UC Davis. I did undergrad there where I was a, a wide receiver at UC Davis. And I don't look it, but at one point I was a college football player. Um, and uh, from there went on to do uh, my residency at UC Davis after medical school there, and then my uh, fellowship in sports medicine at University of Colorado, Denver. Um, no financial disclosures, um, and just getting right into the talk here. So, you know, I think the first place to start with long COVID is, is you know, what is it, the definition? And this has been somewhat evolving over the last year or two, but for the most part, the concepts are there, right? It's, it's about having persistent or prolonged symptoms um, and then a, a definition of what those symptoms look like. So really, we're still trying to figure out more about the etiology, the incidence, and the timelines. So there's ongoing evolving evidence. Long COVID was initially defined as those with late sequelae. So about the one month mark was really what we were running with. Um, really somewhere between one and three months is, is where we sort of cement this diagnosis more recently. Um, we've, uh, the CDC has come out with as of October of 21, um, post COVID-19 condition being persistent sequelae greater than three months. Um, and that's, you know, a variety of symptoms in 10 different organ systems. Um, and still particularly on the treatment and management side, um, there's, there's a lot we're still trying to learn, particularly for non-specific sequelae um, that folks have with long COVID, which we'll get into a lot of cognitive fatigue and exertion. 
dollar. So, uh, and, you know, continuing to define this problem. So the early studies were basically showing anywhere between five to 15% of all comers who, who had a positive COVID test were developing this problem of long COVID or having symptoms beyond a month persistent symptoms, essentially. And a lot of that data initially came from the uh, COVID symptom study out of the UK. Um, some of the more recent studies uh, have shown that these numbers may be a little bit higher, particularly in Asia and Europe. So I'll go over um, the this paper by Chen, who um, really this paper is not even out yet. It's very, very um, recent. Dr. Elliott sort of touched on it. Um, but suggestive that these rates, at least in North America, might be closer to 30% in some cases in terms of folks that are developing prolonged symptoms. Um, so, like I said, you know, as of 2021, October, CDC really has shifted the definition to be symptoms greater than three months from the time of onset. And that also these symptoms have lasted for at least two months and you've ruled out other alternative diagnoses. So if I'm at the three month mark and I'm starting to think I'm getting some symptoms, but they've only been there for, for a week or whatever, that's, that's not enough. So either they've been there the whole time or they've developed and been there for at least two months. Again, this is a variety of different organ systems. So all kinds of, of different symptoms, you know, anywhere between 25 to 50, 50 different symptoms in these 10 organ systems have all been endorsed in, in multiple different papers. Um, our focus is going to be on the neurologic ones. And as it turns out, cognitive fatigue, exertional fatigue, that has to do a lot with neurogenic uh, exercise intolerance, memory, um, and dyspnea are big, big ones. And the uh, uh, WHO definition exclusively includes those three um, as part of the diagnosis of long COVID. So, but the big players here, aside from neurologic, are cardiac, pulmonary, psychiatric. So it's really important to be addressing these things um, when we're dealing with this problem. So this was a relatively early uh, um, diagram that came out um, when we were first starting to identify long COVID from the CDC. At that point, basically, they were recognizing the four-week mark being a threshold where we were worried that these symptoms were persisting longer than they should. Didn't really understand the pathophysiology of the, of the neurologic insult very well or whatever the organ system was. We recognize that cardiovascular, pulmonary, and neurologic, and, and like I said, psychologic manifestations were the most common and the key players. So, and as far as underlying pathology and mechanism is concerned, there's more and more coming out on that, looking at inflammatory pathways that Dr. Elliott touched on, um, and even autoimmune pathways, but I, th I think there's still a lot of research to be done there. Here is a, a nice schematic also from the CDC, looking at all the different organ systems can be that can be affected. And of course, again, for, for the scope of my talk, our focus on, is on those neuro symptoms, which um, we see most commonly. So um, here's a breakdown of long COVID-19 related symptoms. And, and what you can see is at the top of the list is this concept of fatigue, okay? And this fatigue captures both mental fatigue or that cognitive fog, cognitive impairment, as well as exertional fatigue or exercise intolerance. Dyspnea is a big factor there as well. Um, dyspnea can come from cardiopulmonary problems, but it can also come from neurogenic problems um, like dysautonomia, which we'll talk about uh, as we proceed um, in the talk here. So let's get into the long COVID sy symptoms. So a paper by Townsend, um, a, a, in the last couple of years, looked at this concept of fatigue, both cognitive and exertional, and recognized that more than 50% of folks with long COVID 10 weeks out were endorsing these symptoms independent of the severity of their COVID or, or hospitalization. Okay, so that's a key uh, a point that will be threaded throughout this talk and throughout the, the, the research that's looked at long COVID. This is not a problem for folks that are hospitalized, have severe disease, or, or in the ICU. It's more of a problem for them, um, but we see it with mild disease as well. So you'll see that theme recur that long COVID can happen with folks with mild disease and even has been shown to occur with folks with asymptomatic disease and, you know, with the initial infection. So um, when we look at nonspecific neurologic symptoms, these are some of the categories um, or, or, or symptoms and signs that people are, are endorsing. Headache, visual difficulty, mobility, balance, memory problems, cognitive fog, hearing loss, smell and taste loss, mood and anxiety, and PTSD. So a lot of these, we were like, huh, these are very similar, right? And where have we seen these before? 
uh, brain, mild traumatic brain injury with persistent symptoms. These are very similar symptoms um, that are in that group as well. The cardiopulmonary piece, you know, is also very important to look at closely and rule out that there isn't any kind of specific cardiopulmonary disease like pneumonia, myocarditis, et cetera. So that is critical. Um, and th these, these type of problems tend to definitely be more in hospitalized and ICU patients who have taken a hit to those systems. Um, but outside of that group, we, you know, really don't see specific cardiopulmonary disease in by far the majority of the cases with long COVID, they end up having much more uh, um, sort of functional manifestations, particularly from a neurologic perspective. So, so let's look at some of the uh, functional impairments that we see neurologically. Cognitive impairment is one of the big ones, right? Cognitive fatigue, cognitive fog, and, and actual cognitive deficits. So this was a multi-center international trial that was done. You can see there was 85,000 or so folks on this online study. And what they did is they, looked and they actually did testing, computerized cognitive testing to see what level of cognitive impairment they were seeing in folks that had had long COVID. And what they found is there was a variety of mild to severe COVID presentations in this group. So again, some were ICU patients and some were not, right? Had a relatively mild or even asymptomatic disease. And they found regardless of that, they had high rates of at least mild cognitive impairment um, in the overall sort of group here, um, 50 to 90 percent. And we'll, we'll look at a few other studies that, that, that sort of look into this. Um, the highest rates where you saw more moderate or maybe even severe cognitive impairment was in folks that were hospitalized or ICU. Um, but we still saw it in folks that had mild disease as well. Um, so the point being that cognitive assessment and management may be necessary in many of these patients. So when folks are complaining of cognitive fog, it's a hard thing, you know, when you have that subjective sy symptom, it's a hard thing to quantify. So we have access to cognitive testing, neuropsychiatric testing. So I think it's important to take that seriously. And if it's affecting people's lives in a significant way. I used to be able to handle eight hours of work. Now at three hours, I'm toast. That's a significant change. We need to be looking at what's going on there. So, um, and here's a, you know, a few more of the results from that uh, study. Other studies have also come out looking at fr frequent neurocognitive deficits um, after recovery, even from mild uh, COVID-19 infection. So what about exercise intolerance? This is a really fascinating concept um, that we're very familiar with because with mild traumatic brain injury, we see this all the time, right? Where patients, uh, not only do we have to keep them out of sports so they don't hit their head again, but they actually have difficulty getting their heart rate up and exercising for a while. And there's different reasons for that. But a lot of, a lot of them are, are, are related to balanced vision deficits. Some of them are related to autonomic dysfunction, which means that the brain and the central nervous system is having a hard time controlling heart rate, blood pressure, and ventilatory changes that are uh, uh, important during exercise. So, so let's look at the data here. A, a, a good number of papers have come out looking at exercise intolerance. We've actually submitted some data on this as well, that, which I'll share with you. But essentially, it looks like, you know, if you're looking at the broad picture, 30 to 50% of folks with long COVID are endorsing this. Most of the time, it's nonspecific. So it's not that they have myocarditis or pneumonia that that's, you know, it would be obvious that that would cause exercise intolerance. But, you know, we absolutely need to rule this out. But what happens is most of the time we do rule this out. And now we're left with people that are still endorsing significant exercise intolerance. I used to work out every day. Now I can barely, you know, get up the stairs without huffing and puffing. What's going on? You know, we don't know. Your cardiologist said your cardiac testing was normal, right? The PFTs or pulmonary function tests are usually normal and preserved. Cardiac function test is normal. But as we look deeper and do more specific testing with these folks, we do see that they have limited aerobic capacities or VO2 max seems to be impacted um, compared to healthy controls, abnormal vent, uh, ventilation efficiency, uh, uh, oxygen extraction, et cetera, all, all based on different papers that have dived into this. And one common theme around exercise intolerance appears to be that neurogenic exercise intolerance related to autonomic dysfunction, again, the brain's inability to control heart rate, blood pressure changes that are critical when you exercise, seems to be a key player, although maybe not every time, but a key player as far as the mechanism of what's happening here, okay? 
So, you know, how do we assess this in the office? If I'm just in a primary care office and I want to sort of get a sense of, you know, a patient that I'm worried that might have long COVID, whether they have exercise intolerance or not. So it starts with a very good history, right? And you want to be asking about at baseline, what was normal for this patient? What did they used to be able to do? And what are they doing now? So I think if there's a big difference there, um, you know, uh, some people are very athletic. I used to run five miles a day. I can still do pretty well, but at one mile, I, sometimes I just run out of gas. That's still a significant change for that person, right? So we need to really understand what their baseline exercise history looks like and where they're at now and, and really determine based on history if there's some exercise intolerance going on. And then postural or positional symptoms can be very important to ask about, right? If people are saying, every time I get up, I get lightheaded, I get dizzy, or most of the time when I get, then that and that wasn't a thing for me in the past, that's suggestive that there's some autonomy instability going on, right? Postural instability. So we definitely want to be assessing that. As we know, autonomic dysfunction can be an etiology for exercise intolerance. So if they're endorsing that, that, that that's going to really trigger us to think, okay, well, that might be the cause and we need to look into treating that. So uh, a poor man's exertional test that can be done in the clinic is just a basic sit to stand test. You do this for one minute and monitor for symptoms, um, as well as uh, uh, heart rate, uh, oxygen saturation, et cetera. Obviously, you need to make sure the patient is able to tolerate this. So if they have problems and they can't do this, then it's, it's contraindicated. But if they can tolerate a basic sit-to-stand test for one minute, you can monitor them and, and, and document any symptoms or, or, or any abnormalities in their vitals. Another way to do this is, is assess orthostatic instability in the clinic. You have them lay down for five minutes and then you have them stand, repeat their vitals at one, three, and 10 minutes and assessing for any orthostatic hypotension or POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome when their heart rate jumps up by more than 30 to 50 points. Um, and also asking about orthostatic symptoms. So that's also important. Someone may go from laying to standing and it, their numbers may look okay in terms of their vitals. But if they tell you, yeah, I get dizzy and, and, and I feel like I'm going to faint and I, and, and I feel like my heart rate's going up, then those are all things to pay attention to as well. Those would be clinical orthostatic symptoms. And we often see those consistent with what we see on the vitals when we do orthostatic testing. So ultimately, you know, these are all indications for referral for formal testing, right? So it's important these patients are getting formal exertional testing. Again, you got to start off with ruling out specific cardiopulmonary disease, got to go through the cardiologist, pulmonologist, make sure they don't have anything that's uh, uh, more concerning, um, like, like myocarditis, etc. And then from there, um, looking at the symptoms of exercise intolerance and and if they're not otherwise explained by that cardiac or pulmonary workup, starting to ask the questions of, you know, what's going on there. Um, and again, these are patients that will say, you know, I'm not tolerating activities of daily living, walking, stairs, et cetera. Some of them, they're doing fine with that, but they're just not at their baseline exercise tolerance. They used to be very active and now they struggle trying to keep up with that. So, uh, and then certainly new postural symptoms or positional, those are all things in the history that should, that should trigger um, uh, a referral for formal exertional testing and then also signs of exercise intolerance, which we would see when we test the patient, whether it's with the sit to stand test, you can do a six minute walk test. If you've got a clinic where you can walk them around and keep it monitored or orthostatic testing. I'll talk to you guys a little bit about our uh, exertional testing that we do in clinic too, um, which, you know, we utilize monitoring and, and, and uh, uh, either a bike or a treadmill to do that. So, um, what about psychologic symptoms? So, so you know, mood, behavioral, sleep symptoms are also very common. 50 to 90% uh, anxiety and mood are most commonly endorsed. Some folks have PTSD, particularly if they've been hospitalized, have been in the ICU. So it's really important to address those things. Sleep disturbance is also huge here, 30 to 60% in those that have long COVID. So we all know if we don't sleep well, how that affects cognitive, right, uh, and mood. So that becomes a really critical symptom, which is a modifier of the other problems. And so you got to ask about it and you got to, you, you need to address it and treat it. So ultimately these become critical pieces uh, uh, to the management and, you know, mood, behavior, sleep, they're also very common in post-concussive syndrome. So it, these are things that we always are, are looking at uh, and because their impacts on neurologic uh, function and cognitive function are, are, are so big.
All right, here's a um, study uh, by Davis et al. about seven months um, looking uh, at a survey-based, international survey-based study, uh, 3,700 or so long COVID patients. They were all at, beyond a month out um, using sort of the, the original definition. Um, and they basically wanted to see where, we, where people were at seven months out. OK, so, you know, we've got a few studies that have sort of looked at this a little bit more long term. And this is one of them. And what they found is when they look at looked at these patients with a survey study that there was a variety of 25 to 50 symptoms that were being endorsed again across nine different organ systems. In this particular survey, only eight percent were hospitalized patients, which means, you know, 90 percent plus had mild disease that did not require hospitalizations as far as their initial COVID. But despite that, 91% were still unresolved at seven months. So they had at least one symptom at, at that point or some, some form of ongoing problems. Fatigue, exercise intolerance, and cognitive dysfunction were the top symptoms that were being endorsed after six months. 88% reported cognitive dysfunction and memory deficits. Now this is a subjective reporting survey. There wasn't testing done here. 45% were at a reduced work or half time or less. 23%, a quarter of them were off of work uh, on disability. 30% per report, again, reported POTS. So these are folks that were asked to log when they get up, if they get symptomatic. Um, and 85% reported frequent symptom relapses, cognitive, exertional, uh, uh, and, and stress and mood triggers, meaning things would sort of go up and down, good days, bad days, good weeks, bad weeks. And you know when we saw that, we said, Again, that sounds familiar because a lot of our post-concussive folks with mild traumatic brain injury, we, we talk about a waxing and waning course over weeks, months, because depending on how those systems are doing, depending on how they slept a given night, a given week, things can be better or a lot worse. And this is a very common thing with, with uh, uh, long COVID as well. Um, the Wuhan study is a big one to look at because you know they, they were a lot of the folks that were uh, um, uh, put into this study were from the early, uh, the original um, uh, uh, COVID. And, and so, and they were able to follow these guys, not only at six months, but also at 12 months. And not only with surveys, but with actual visits. So there were some testing done, some objective testing done in these patients. So there was about 1,200 patients that um, they had in this study, and they had a, a little over 3,000 matched controls as well. And their findings were that about half of them still at least endorse one symptom even at a year. Um, now that was improved from 68% at six months. So that's good to see. And that's predominantly in an untreated group, right? So if you are treating these folks with the appropriate treatment, then you would hopefully start to see a better improvement in terms of their symptoms between six months and a year. But the point being that this isn't necessarily just you know, a, a problem of weeks or months. This, this, you know, can can linger over a year, and it, and in a uh, fifty percent of the cases with with this study, it did. Um, fatigue, muscle weakness were some of the most common symptoms being endorsed. Thirty percent had were reporting persistent dyspnea um, at a year, and that number was twenty six percent at six months. And remember, this dyspnea concept ties into exertional fatigue and exercise intolerance. But the point I want to make here is there's really no improvement between six months uh, and a year, right? 26 to 30 percent. Maybe got a little worse, but really that's about the same. Um, and again, I think it's the importance of being able to recognize there's a problem and implement treatment for exercise intolerance, which obviously wasn't done with these early studies. Um, they did do some objective tests like the six minute walk test. And again, saw no difference in terms of their exercise intolerance at six to 12 months. So not only was there persistent problems subjectively that was being endorsed, but they objectively were able to test that and, and not see improvements just because people waited. Um, so, a few other findings of so persistent diffusion imp impairments were seen with, with the pulmonary studies in 25 to 50% at one year, um, and 26% had persistent mood and anxiety at one year, and that number at six months was 23%, essentially the same. Again, showing that without intervention the, the, and just sort of waiting and telling people to wait to get better, uh, that doesn't seem to work out really well, at least over this six-month span in, in this study. So. Um, and ultimately, these folks, when they compared them uh, uh, to the controls that they had, they had significantly worse quality of life, dyspnea, mood and anxiety scores, both at six months and at 12 months. So 
this is one of the more recent studies that, that has come out. Um, this is actually uh, still has not officially come out, um, but this is a study, a, a large global meta analysis um, that Dr. Elliott shared with me that, that, you know, a lot of people have not seen these results yet. Um, basically what this uh, meta analysis was looking at 50 studies that were published between July of 2021 to March of 2022. So a little bit more recent. Again, most of those studies were probably conducted back with the original and maybe the Delta variant. So uh, this data is not really going to pertain to Omicron and some of the more recent stuff. But when you look at these numbers, it's kind of scary, right? So long COVID rates were actually close to 50%. Dr. Elliott sort of touched on this in, in, the, in the panel for the global prevalence of four months. Um, you know, that's a much bigger number than the, sort of the 10% we've seen. It was regional, so regional dependent. So for example, in North America um, or in America, we we're around 30%. Um, higher in hospitalized patients, but not that much lower in non-hospitalized patients, still at 34% um, the prevalence of long COVID after having an index COVID infection. So, um, and also consistent as far as the, the most common symptoms, fatigue, uh, again, both cognitive and exertional was the most common symptom endorsed, um, followed by memory problems, dyspnea, and sleep dysfunction. And they also looked at risk factors and recognized that pulmonary disease, specifically asthma, increase your relative rate by two. Um, female gender being old, older, metabolic syndrome, like obesity, et cetera. All of those had seemed to have some effect on, on the risk factor of developing long COVID, but none of them with a really high relative uh, uh, risk rate, right? So this is all between one and two um, in terms of the odds ratio. So Essentially, the way I look at this is long COVID, there may be some people that are slightly at higher risk based on age or sex or, you know, uh, underlying uh, uh, disease that they may already have. But really, long COVID can affect anybody. So just because you're a young, healthy, metal aged guy or teenager, it doesn't mean it can't impact you. We've seen that across all the studies. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, potentially a, if we want to talk about a protective piece. Um, this was a study that came out looking at vaccination status seems to reduce long COVID rates by 49%. We also know vaccination can reduce more mortality, hospitalization, and symptom duration. So um, we need a lot more studies here. There's anecdotal reports that people from the vaccine have developed long COVID symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, you know, the evidence, at least the papers that are out, are suggestive that if you're vaccinated, you can feel a little bit better about a lower risk of developing long COVID, but it doesn't mean you're out of the woods. Here's a study we did out of our center looking at vaccines. Um, we obviously have a lot of mild traumatic brain injury patients. Um, uh, and mild traumatic brain injury patients with persistent post-concussive symptoms are folks that remain symptomatic with these very similar functional neurologic symptoms, right? Cognitive ex exercise intolerance, et cetera, for months and sometimes years. So what we wanted to know is how the COVID vaccine affected them because a large number of them were getting vaccinated, obviously. So, um, and what we did is we looked at um, our survey data, and we basically asked these patients that had mild traumatic brain injury with persistent post-concussive symptoms, how did the vaccine impact you, okay? And so what we saw is, you know, half of them endorsed the regular expected vaccine reaction, right? So for maybe a day, they got fever, chills, or muscle aches, or whatever, which is typical of the general population. Um, but we also wanted to know how many of you guys had significantly worsened post-concussive symptoms, cognitive balance, visual exercise intolerance, for, you know, more than just a day, right? For several days or, or at least a week or two. And um, we had about 6% that reported that and said, you know, that they felt that their post-concussive symptoms were aggravated significantly. But it was really just for days at the most for one or two weeks. So we, we you know, we felt like that was good data and support of, you know, really not having any contraindication for folks that have mild traumatic brain injury to get the vaccine. Um, and the other thing that we noticed is the few of the patients that had mild traumatic brain injury that then got COVID, 100% um, of them said that their functional neurologic deficits significantly got worse. So in other words, you know, probably better to get the vaccine to protect yourself from COVID, even if you have mild traumatic brain injury was more or less our conclusion with this. So, 
Um, some great questions came up about primary care um, during the panel. What are some things our front lines can be doing, looking at? And there's some great data, a uh, number of different papers that have come out for how we should approach a more standardized primary care approach to, to uh, evaluating long COVID. Um, and I think, you know, in the end, it's like any other evaluation. It starts with a complete history and exam, um, an appropriate workup based on the history and exam. But I think it's really important that there's some detailed questions asked because the, the subtleties here are what matters, right? Like, you know, with stroke and with some of these other things, there's sort of big red flags, right? And, and, and we're trained as physicians to look for those things. But with long COVID, you know, you need to rule those things out, but they're usually not there. And it's only when you start to ask the more subtle questions about cognitive impairment, how, you know, how's your work going? You know, when you exercise now, what's it look like? What you used to look like? And those details can really uh, shed some light on, on the patient's issues. And I think a lot of it is just really listening to the patient about what their concerns are, particularly how it affects them in their world. I think that's the key with this. Um, certainly, we need to rule out specific disease stroke, cardiac disease, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, all those things need to be ruled out. 99% of the time, that's not going to be what's going on. After you rule it out, you need to continue to uh, offer, you know, the options for these patients. So, you know, traditionally, especially initially, there wasn't a whole lot we could do, right? So we would sort of get some labs, some x-rays, rule some things out and say, well, you know, everything looks pretty good, you know, um, hang in there. Right, um, but over over the last year or two, we've we've learned that a number of things can be done: counseling, medications in some cases, home rehab, and then other options having to do with specific neural rehab that I'll get into shortly. Um, the nice rapid guidelines are also another great approach to the primary care workup. Um, really, again, initiated somewhere between one and three months. If, if your patient's still significantly symptomatic, you need to be thinking about this diagnosis. And again, being thorough with the history, um, being holistic and fo focusing on these functional impairments that we know occur with long COVID. Cognitive, exertional, mood, sleep, these are all very important things. Um, and certainly the laboratory workup, the x-rays at that time are appropriate. Like I said, most of the time they're going to look good. If they don't, then obviously we, we follow up with what we need to do. Um, but at this point, you know, these folks need the appropriate referrals, and they're probably going to need multidisciplinary rehabilitation, occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. These are all things that we have in, in our toolbox to help these patients with their physical ailments, their cognitive ailments, their, their, their uh, uh, psychiatric ailments, et cetera. So let's talk about the cohort that, you know, our small cohort that we saw in our clinic. And we, because we're a brain injury clinic, we have a, a great platform for addressing problems with functional neurologic deficits, whether it's cognitive, exercise intolerance, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can see on that schematic are the post-concussive domains, right? So these are very common uh, area, uh, symptom cluster areas that people complain, balance, vision, cognitive, mood, sleep, headache. And they're very similar to what we're hearing from the long COVID patients. So we, we didn't reinvent the wheel, we use the, the resources that we have in place in our clinic to be able to assess some of these patients. So this is our, our first sort of cohort. Our numbers have grown since then. We've probably seen, I don't know, maybe 30 to 50 patients at this point. But we put together some data on these 10 adults, um, all with long COVID. Average age was about 40. So mostly, you know, these are all sort of no pediatric cases. We might have had like a 20-year-old in there. Um, and on average, they were presenting somewhere between four and 12 months. So we, I wasn't seeing anybody coming to me at one month, right? So it was clear that they had persistent symptoms and their primaries were, okay, you should probably get evaluated. Um, their average uh, symptom score, we use a, a validated um, uh, uh, concussion-based uh, screen, which asks a lot of the questions in these domains. And on average, they, they're sort of moderate level in terms of symptoms, scoring 35 out of 90. Um, we looked at cognitive, mood, and sleep as being the top symptom clusters that were being endorsed. Um, and work intolerance was there basically in all 10 of these. So um, these folks were in best case scenario part-time and three of them were on disability 30% uh, or not, not able to work. 
Um, we did computerized cognitive testing. We have two different versions of this in our clinic and found impairments, at least mild impairments, in seven out of the eight. We also have an evoke potential or QEG-based technology, which is a neurophysiologic test um, that's cognitive-based in nature. And six out of the eight that we were able to test showed abnormal neurophysiology as well. What about exercise intolerance and what about vestibular ocular? We'll get into those. So as far as exercise intolerance, um, nine out of the 10 patients that we tested um, had this and only two out of the nine were able to tolerate heart rates greater than 120 beats per minute. And for the ages that we had, that's pretty light exertion that they were tolerating. Um, exertional rehab dose was assigned to all of them because that's the goal of testing exercise is figuring out what's the appropriate dose that they can start to do exertional rehab. Dysautonomia was associated with almost all of them. Eight of nine patients, uh, 25 out of 28 visits where we did exertional testing, we saw some form of dysautonomia, whether it was clinical dysautonomia or um, uh, dysautonomia on orthostatic vitals. Um, vestibular ocular motor screen. So this is a very common thing in, in mild traumatic brain injury. We do this on all the concussion patients. We're essentially using a validated screen out of UPMC. I'll, I'll show you the paper there that came out in 2014 to assess balance and vision and the integration of the two. What we saw, and this was, we were very interested in what this would look like in the long COVID patients, is that the majority of them had problems with the vestibular ocular motor screen, which is an objective way to assess symptoms of dizziness and visual dysfunction. Near point convergence, which normally should be under eight centimeters, on average in this group was 14 centimeters. King Divot is another ocular motor test. I'll, I'll give you a, an example of what that looks like. Generally, on average, these guys are able to get through a card in 15 seconds. They were significantly delayed at 20 seconds. And then ocular tracking, we, have, we do have an ocular uh, motor tracker in the clinic. We use that in five of the patients. And again, in the majority of the ones that, that we tested, we did see specific ocular motor abnormalities. So, um, so yeah, again, you know, we, we sort of use this approach, um, this model that we use for traumatic brain injury um, to assess functional neurologic import, uh, impairments in folks with long COVID. And you know, what we saw was, okay, we're seeing a lot of similarities here. Um, so here's a study that we just recently uh, uh, presented at AMSSM this last April, looking at exercise intolerance and long COVID, okay? Here's the punchline, uh, and I just presented this. 90% of the patients we looked at had it, and if we look at the reason why, there was a variety of reasons, okay, and vestibular ocular was maybe part of it, but Dysautonomia and clinical dysautonomia were the most two common causes, okay? And this is assessed by doing orthostatic testing and cardiovagal testing while we're doing ex monitored exertion testing. Um, this is one that looks at the vestibular ocular motor screen. We also just presented this um, uh, at the same conference. And again, what's the punchline here? We saw vestibular ocular, uh, vestibular ocular motor abnormalities based on this validated screen in 80% of the patients. Um, and we also noticed that near point convergence, which is part of the VOM screen, and King Divot, which is its own evaluation to assess oculomotor dysfunction and visual dysfunction, were, were both significantly abnormal compared to norms. Um, the, the VOM screen is sort of touched on. This is a very important assessment, again, that we use for mild traumatic brain injury. Um, really, the, the, the the papers and the abstracts that we've submitted on VOMS at this point are pretty novel. There isn't a lot of studies looking at this objectively, but out of our center, we expect to get more and more data on this. And there's no question right now, I can tell you anecdotally from seeing a good number of these patients, that balance and vision is a problem. Um, not in all of them, but in a good, good number of them, and we're able to objectively assess that. This is, um, you know, I want to share this. We, we uh, uh, looked at this paper a few years back, specifically with respect to mild traumatic brain injury, recognizing that near point convergence and King Divot scores that were elevated were, were predictors of people that were going to have longer recoveries, right? Um, so those concussions that, that recovered under a month, um, their numbers looked a lot better than those that um, had prolonged symptoms. And those elevated numbers that we were seeing in, in, in the, in the, prolonged group look very similar to what we're seeing in the long COVID group. 
Here are some examples of some of the tests I've been sort of showing you. On the upper left there, that's uh, uh, an example of how a computerized cognitive test, this is uh, one that's called IMPACT. We have another one called Cambridge Brain Sciences. But what you can see here is if you've got a patient who you know is, is pretty high functioning, you, you wouldn't expect them to be below the first, even if you don't have baseline data, which in a lot of these cases we don't because these aren't you know elite athletes and stuff, um, you, you know that you know, they shouldn't be that far below the first percentile, right? So this, this person's really struggling with processing speed and reaction time. And so you're really seeing some significant impairment on the cognitive testing here. These are the King Divot tests, very quick, crude tests where you're reading numbers left to right and we're timing it. A validated screen that's been there for oculomotor control that, that ultimately comes from the brain for the last 20, 30 years out of Mayo Clinic. So a great sort of quick and dirty test to assess vision, oculomotor, a little bit of cognitive and reaction time. This is an example of an oculomotor tracker. Um, so what we can see here is smooth pursuits, for example, in this patient are not looking very smooth. Um, here is someone doing balance testing on a force plate that picks up sway velocities. What you can see there is the reason the scores are highlighted in red is because they're well above the normative for, for this person's age and sex, which is the gray comparison for each one of those tests. Those are five different versions of the test. Um, and then finally, probably the most sophisticated of them all, the evoke potential, which is a neurophysiologic test, um, the audio P300. And what, you know, I won't get into the details here, but basically when we see abnormal neurophysiology, the uh, uh, brain response to cognitive tasks is not normal. Um, we're not getting the deep P300 peaks that we're supposed to get. And so as a result, we see abnormalities here and, and, and we'll continue to track these until they normalize. So here's a real life case. And I actually wanted to choose one of the pediatric cases that we've seen because you know, I've been presenting on a lot of the adult data. But this, this can affect teenagers as well. So this was a 16-year-old healthy girl um, that I saw that actually had a very mild COVID case, no, not even any fevers, and certainly not hospitalized or anything like that, about five days of symptoms, but subsequently um, developed severe chronic fatigue, um, couldn't, at some point just couldn't tolerate school or academic activities, complained of cognitive fog, memory difficulties, difficulties with the screen, 30 minutes was just running out of gas with the screen, um, but also was a, uh, this, this uh, athlete was, was a track runner on the team and couldn't exercise, uh, uh, excuse, couldn't exercise or tolerate uh, practicing or being on the team. There was, uh, you know, these were all ultimately nonspecific symptoms that fell into the category of exertional and cognitive fatigue. Um, and, you know, again, a number of papers have come out looking at, you know, some of these long-term symptoms related to long COVID in children and adolescents as well. Luckily, the rates are lower. Um, but as Dr. Elliott uh, uh, quoted, you know, uh, during the panel, they're there. So, you know, we need to continue to be mindful of this. And certainly he's seeing um, some pediatric patients in the pediatric infectious disease clinic um, that are, uh, you know, having these problems. So, so what do we do? You know, how, how do we help? So this, this, this last, you know, 40 minutes was all about getting to this point, right? What can we do? And I think the big point is there are ways to treat this. And again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We know how to treat functional neurologic deficits because we've been doing it for years and we've really done a lot in the last 10 to 20 years with mild traumatic brain injury. So we just need to, you know, look at some of these uh, uh, concepts and apply them to long COVID and continue to research outcomes. Okay. So, you know, cognitive testing is a, is an easy one, for example. So we have two different uh, cognitive tests, computerized cognitive tests in our clinic um, to really try to assess for cognitive performance, um, cognitive deficits, to some degree cognitive fatigue. Um, so, you know, implementing these things, uh, obviously, again, ruling out specific disease, but beyond that, really looking at cognitive testing and then putting together cognitive plans for work and school. Now, you used to be able to do eight hours, but now you do four hours. Um, and you run out of gas and you need more breaks and so on and so forth, well, we can work with that. Let's put together a plan that allows you to still be at work uh, or, and, or be at school as opposed to have to be off completely and, and, and maybe do some cognitive rehab, um, whether that's through speech or occupational therapy or vision, to be able to you know, sort of rebuild those areas as you continue to stimulate them at the same time by maintaining yourself in school or at work. Um, but it's hard to do that when you're expected to do eight hours and all you got in the tank is four, right? 
then you're just failing, right? And if you're failing and you start to feel like a failure, then nothing goes good, right? You have to set these, you got to understand where they're at and set these people up to be successful, okay? And then from there, they can, they can recover and rebuild. Uh, formal neuropsychiatric testing is definitely a, a, a key, key component of the evaluation for these guys because you know, we, we basically consider this for more severe cognitive problems or, or, or more chronic cognitive problems, certainly after three to six months, which is a lot of the, what the long COVID is. The problem is it's a little bit harder. These are six to eight hour evaluations, harder to get in. It might take a few months, et cetera, et cetera. But regardless, we're usually pulling the trigger on that referral as well when we see these patients. What about exercise intolerance? So again, most of this is going to be non-specific exercise intolerance or, or neurogenic in nature. Let's rule out cardiopulmonary disease. And then from there, let's figure out what we need to do to get these people exercising back to normal again, right? And it starts with monitored exertional testing. That's John Letty, uh, him and his group at University of Buffalo have about close to two decades now, very good research looking at exertional uh, uh, testing for neurogenic dysautonomia and other problems related to brain injury, as well as the active rehab pro uh, protocol, which is a graded monitored exertional rehabilitation program. So again, no need to reinvent the wheel. We know how to work with this. Um, and basically, it starts with some good testing to assess well, what are the causes. If there's neurogenic or brain-based exercise intolerance, what are the causes? We know autonomic dysfunction is the most common, but it may not be the case in, in a you know, in this particular given patient, it's case by case. So we need to assess, figure out if it is dysautonomia, is it vestibular in nature, is it just deconditioning? And then we can work with our OTs, occupational therapists, and our PTs to underlying causes, okay? If it's autonomic dysfunction, folks like Emily Rich are going to be speaking, uh, 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 I don't know, in a week or two, um, they're, they're great at treating that, right, and helping the patients deal with that with, with autonomic rehab. If it's more vestibular or deconditioning in nature, our physical therapists are great at treating that. So we need to identify and then get the treatments going. And ultimately, you know, they, these folks need to be on a gradual monitored exertional rehab because the only way to build tolerance back up is to do it. But again, you got to figure out the right dose that works for them. If you overdo it, they're going to fail. If you underdo it, they're not getting any kind of stimulus that they need to recover. So it's all about honing in on their sweet spot, and it's going to be case by case. So you're going to have to figure out what that is for each patient. Other things. So neuropsychiatric symptoms are, you know, like, like PTSD, a mood, behavioral anxiety, sleep dysfunction, as we discussed, very common. We can't neglect these things in this group. Um, we need to we'll screen for them, and then we need to treat them. And there's a lot of treatment options. Counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, support groups, medications in some cases. Formal neuropsychiatric evaluation can help with this component as well. Dr. Siegelman had a great <clears throat> reflection piece on COVID-19. This is um, from uh, a couple of years ago when, when um, back in 2020 when you know, we were seeing this with the original variant. And uh, I think this is a great piece for, for all of you guys to check out. Um, but basically his point, he's, a, you know, he's an MD, he was a doctor that, that develop this problem. Okay. And about three months out, he put this piece together and he said, you know, it's important. These were some of his, his, his highlight points. It's important to understand that even mild disease, you don't have to be an ICU person, even mild disease can ultimately have dramatic effects as far as the persistent long COVID effects are concerned. And that lack of objective data, meaning, you know, normal testing on your PCP evaluation, et cetera, doesn't preclude to having these problems. And that when you're in that, it's hard to ask for help because you feel like, okay, well, no one's finding anything, so maybe this is all in my head, right? And patients ultimately need validation for their problems. And he said, I'm lucky because he's a physician. He was taken a lot more seriously than probably a lot of other people were or are. Um, I felt like this was a great uh, line here. He said, I, you know, I've been reminded the need to listen to the patient first, even in the absence of conclusive testing. One of my early, early mentors in medical school once told me, it, you know, if you're if it's a tough scenario, you can't quite figure it out. Just listen to the patient. If you listen long enough, they will give you the answer. Um, and this reminded me of that. <clears throat> Ultimately, our take-home points for today: um, long COVID. Um, you know, obviously the nomenclature, number number of other things. I. I still use long COVID. It's the easiest to come out of my mouth. Um, symptom sequelae greater than one to three three months, basically. Variety of symptoms. Non-specific fatigue, both mental and physical, are the most common. Um, we got to rule out specific pathology, pulmonary, uh, cardiac, brain, etc. 
But from there, we're usually dealing with functional neurologic deficits. Um, always assess for mood and sleep. They can be major modifiers to everything else that's going on. And validation and consideration of treatment options for folks that are having these pers persistent complaints. If it's affecting them, if it's affecting their world, it matters to them. Okay, so we need to figure out what are their options to help them get to a better place. Um, and this is, I think, my last slide um, in terms of some of the services. I, I sort of touched on this, some of the services that, that we can offer. Um, we you know, do cognitive testing. We do exertional testing. Um, um, and really try to, in a nutshell, put together a cognitive plan, put together an active rehab protocol plan for where their exertional rehab should be, and then utilize neural rehab occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, and sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling for the psychiatric components to really help these folks get better. It's usually multidisciplinary. It's usually not one thing that you do. You got to do a mix of these things. Um, and that's it. So hopefully I left, it looks like a little bit of time for questions. Um, I appreciate you guys. Yeah, thanks. Should, can we start with the panel here? Okay, yes. What's this dyspnea? Dysautonomia, maybe? Is that the word? Dyspnea. Oh, dys dyspnea. Yeah. So dyspnea is when you're short of breath, okay? Um, it's a subjective symptom that pe patients have where they're short of breath. You know, when doctors hear that, the immediate thing we think of is cardiopulmonary, and I think that's important, you know? Um, certainly dyspnea can come from a pneumonia, from a myocarditis, from heart disease. Um, so... That's, that's what it means. Uh, in the context of long COVID, you got to rule those things out. But also remember that perceived dyspnea can also be from neurogenic dysautonomia, right? If you're trying to exercise and your heart rate and blood pressure and ventilatory system isn't being controlled well by the autonomic nervous system, well, what are you going to feel? Dyspnea, right? Um, you're going to feel like you're not able to catch your breath. They all, a lot of them will also endorse lightheadedness, you know, feeling like they're going to faint. We call that presyncope, et cetera, sometimes dizziness, nausea, et cetera. But great question. Other questions? Yes, sir. Is the virus gone? Is this post viral damage? Is it clear that the virus is left? Oh, yeah. And the damage is still there. That's a great question. I, I, I don't know if everyone can hear the questions. Probably not. I'll repeat them. Uh, is the virus gone? Is this post viral damage or, or is the virus still there wreaking its, wreaking its havoc? As far as we know, I think we don't exactly know the answer to that uh, or, or the exact mechanism of why this is happening. Um, but I think more and more we're leaning towards it's gone. And there's this post inflammatory coagulopathy type of things going on that are affecting and organs, okay? And in this case, you know, uh, uh, we're talking a lot about neuro, but obviously other, other organs can suffer as well. So, you know, the brain is the most complicated one, right? So I think um, part of the reason we see a lot of the functional neurologic symptoms being like primary on the list is by far the brain is the most complicated organ. So um, even relatively small hits to the white matter um, are going to have an impact on people, right? We certainly have seen that with mild traumatic brain injury for a long time. So, other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, you're drawing parallels to post concussive, long, long, we'll call them long term symptoms. Yeah. And, you know, everything's pretty much stopping so far what we're seeing at 12 months. Well, we're two years now. I'm 22 months. So, my, my question is are, are you seeing what sort of Conclusions can we draw based on your post-concussive recovery over time, both cognitive and mood related? And I notice you, you draw a clear distinction between the two. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, uh, I don't know. And, and you were loud there, so hopefully the the the, the uh, Zoom folks heard, and I got a nod that they did. So um, I won't repeat your your great question. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, <clears throat> that's a tough question because we know what mild traumatic brain injury and persistent post-concussive symptoms can look like at one year, at two years, at three years and beyond, because some of those pa patients, even with mild traumatic brain injury can have some per level of permanence. Right. Um, and because this is a different process, even though there are similarities, you know, I, <clears throat> um, I'm hesitant 
to sort of try to uh, predict the future, you know, as far as long COVID goes, right? Because like you said, it's only been around for so many years. In your case, I think you said you've had 22 months worth of symptoms. So clearly, we know based on the research already, um, the Wuhan study, you know, looking at a year and recognizing that 50% of them are still endorsing symptoms. You're somebody that's endorsing symptoms at closer to two years, right? And if I want to draw analogies to persistent post-concussive symptoms or traumatic brain injury, we know that it can go on even further, right? So ultimately, I think the best we can do is continue to follow patients like yourself, continue to treat patients like yourself, and look at the long-term data in terms of specifically how it looks like with long COVID. In terms of how mild traumatic brain injury and persistent post-concussive symptoms look, yeah, we see some folks that continue to have cognitive impairment um, two, three years out. The numbers are pretty small at that point. You know, if you're starting with all comers in the beginning, about 20% or so will have symptoms beyond a month based on the data. I'm, I'm talking about traumatic brain injury right now. And it's only about 10% of those who end up having symptoms over a year. So you're getting to a smaller and smaller number, thank goodness, the further out you get. But it, that affects somebody um, and so, or, or, or some cohort of patients because that's a very common uh, uh, condition, as is long COVID. So, yeah, we, we, we are going to need to learn more about the more long-term effects of long COVID, whether it's cognitive or mood. Um, and I think the mood part, and it's important to distinguish those two, because mood in particular is a little bit more challenging to track long term because there's so many variables that can affect that, right? Um, but uh, and, and same with cognitive, but I think it's a little bit easier to get a sense of someone's cognitive baseline. And you know, if cognitively they're they're nowhere near where they used to be, and you can sort of look at that with cognitive testing and neuropsychiatric testing, um, I think that's an easier one to look at. Um, mood. You do the same thing, but you also recognize that when someone's been through what you've been through, that's in and of itself going to have such an impact on mood, right? So there's all these secondary effects that cause people to, you know, have anxiety, PTSD, depression. So, but in the end, none of that matters when we talk about treating someone, right? We want to help people get better and get back to their baseline, regardless of where it's coming from. So, but there is, you know, in those cases, I think both primary and secondary reasons um, for those effects. So. Yes. Um, Jamie online asked, what levels of improvement have you seen after treating long COVID patients? That's a great question. You know, what, what are we seeing with um, outcomes with treatment? So, and one of the first things that, you know, I presented is we need more research there, right? So we are pretty good at data in terms of the incidence and the prevalence and these kinds of things. But um, in terms of what truly is the outcome of the intervention, so interventional studies for treatment, we're it's not we're not there yet, right? We we you know we're we're still waiting for those to come out. So I can't say you know evidence based uh, specifically for long COVID is telling us that this or this works and this or this doesn't work as well. Um, what I can say, and I alluded to it in the talk, is that we have tremendous evidence base for mild traumatic brain injury functional neurologic deficits, which look very similar. And so if we know certain things work for these problems, um, and we, you know, we go one level below long COVID as a diagnosis, and now we look at cognitive impairment as a diagnosis. We look at exercise intolerance as a diagnosis. We look at uh, uh, PTSD as a diagnosis. Well, we know what the treatments you know, look like for those things, right? And we have evidence there, so we need to be implementing those. And then over the next couple of years, I think we'll catch up on how, how for the long COVID diagnosis specifically, how these interventions are, are helping folks with long COVID. But we don't, we don't really have that yet. Yes? Um, just to mention long-term COVID, uh, we have a daughter who had COVID in March of 2020, so early on, and fortunately was able to get into a TBI program, but not until the following September. No one knew what it was, but she also subsequently suffered a concussion. And fortunately or not, the TBI program worked once, but she's you know, 22 months out, almost two years out, yeah. and she still has dysautonomia, severe fatigue. You know, she didn't work 
for a year and a half. And it is that part time. And uh, I don't know. I don't know where we're going with it. She continues to improve, but the TBI people worked in her office. Uh, where, uh, where is? It's uh, Casa Colina in Pomona. Okay. Did you guys hear that question? Okay, that was a great question slash comment. And I'm not surprised to hear that. And I don't know if what took her to the TBI clinic was the fact that she developed a concussion or if you guys sort of knew to do that. Um, but like we talked about in this talk, and this, you know, obviously the reason we got involved is when we started hearing about these symptoms and these problems, we were like, huh, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. And we started evaluating some of these patients after we talked to you know, some of the PCPs in town. And, well, you know, there was no long Right, right, yeah, yeah, of course. And, and, and that's, I think, still a challenge in our community um, because it's, it's a multidisciplinary approach that takes, I think, a lot of resources. It's not easy to just say, all right, here's our long haul, you know, or, or long COVID center, right? Um, so utilizing the resources that already exist, I think, are big. Um, and as we move forward, we see how we can continue to streamline that and, and get better and better. Yeah, that's so. awesome. Amazing. Yeah. You know, and, and she did that pops. I mean, yeah. Tachycardia, the classic. Right. The classic long -term and I think the, the other point you made is whether you have a concussion that's taken long time to recover, whether you have long COVID, you know, the longer it takes, the more likely the chance that you, know, you get another hit along the way, right? Whether it's a head injury or whatever. So, and then when you have the two together, um, now, you know, you're sort of, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what had what impact because, you know, they both have similar, potentially similar impacts in terms of your neurologic function. So, um, you know, we've certainly had a few patients that have had both of those in whatever order, and uh, it's usually not a good combination. So. Well, it was three hours a day, three days a week. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like kind of an intensive program, yeah, rehab program. To do five, but she couldn't yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Any other final questions before we wrap up? Well, I know we're over time here. Okay. Thank you all for being here.